Gregory of the AI Fringe, and welcome to our online audience who are joining us via streaming. Um, my name is Justin King. I am a director at Milltown Partners. We are the organizers of the AI Fringe. Very pleased to be with here, with, here with you today. Now, today is the first day of the AI Safety Summit at Bletchley Park. And while we may not have gotten the golden ticket to go to Bletchley Park, I, assure, I can assure you all the conversations here will be equally as sparkling and as starling, and not just indeed here, but across the country where we have many other AI Fringe events happening. Now, I'm heartened by the number of people in this room who are representing so many different organizations from industry, from academia, civil society, and government. And I'm also heartened by the fact that joining us in this room and joining us online, we have people from so many different communities. It's this diversity that has really contributed to so many of the re really robust and dynamic discussions and indeed debates that we've had here over the last couple of days. But it's the diversity which is gonna be at the heart of how we are going to make a future of AI that is beneficial for all. Today, we have an excellent program in store for you. Our day is going to begin with a series of conversations about the impact of AI on the creative industries. From there, we'll move on to an equally important topic, how the public can be included in decisions about AI governance and the role that AI will play in our society. After lunch, we are going to delve into the complexities of AI and the law, and then we are going to finish the day with a discussion about how AI interacts with consumer protection and market competition. Now, just for something a little bit different, today in room Bronte B, which is just across the foyer, we have an experiential art performance called Cybot. This artificial intelligence tool draws your portrait in real time, it asks you questions, speaks to you, while it processes your characteristics and reinterprets them in an abstract drawing. This is gonna be a very, um, nice and unique thing to take away from today's event, so please do have a look. And finally, before we begin, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of our partners. They played a really, really big role in helping us develop the program and put on this event, so thank you to them. And now for some housekeeping notes. Fire exits are at the front and the rear of the theater. All sessions of this program will be live streamed via our YouTube channel and videos from all sessions will be available on our YouTube channel shortly after this event. We invite you to join the conversation on social media. If you go to X, or formerly Twitter, um, our handle is AI Summit Fringe, and you can use the hashtag, hashtag AI Fringe. We're also on LinkedIn if you search for the name AI Fringe. And before we get into the program, I just wanted to say thank you so much for supporting our code of conduct. This is listed on our website and it's just incredibly important to us. Now, we'll begin this morning with a focus, as I mentioned, on AI and the creative industries. This is a subject, of course, that is a, of a great interest to many people and organizations in our society. So I would like to introduce our first moderator to the stage. Francesca Panetta is director of AKO Storytelling uh, Institute at University of Arts London. She'll kick off our program today. First, she'll give an introduction of a short video, and then she will lead our panel discussion, first panel of the day. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you very much, Justin. Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to AI Media and the Creative Industries. Um, so, as we know, this is one of the AI uh, fringe events which is linked to the UK Government AI Safety Summit. And today we're going to be specifically looking at the impact of generative AI tools on the creative industries. Um, I'm Francesca Panetta. I am director of the AKO Storytelling Institute at the University of Arts London. Um, I'm a new media artist, director and journalist and have spent my career working with new technologies, most recently with AI to educate audiences around the threats of deep fakes and mis and disinformation. So we're gonna start with a very short show reel, um, which just gives some examples of works made by artists and creators illustrating how AI can be used for creative expression, as well as how it can highlight some of the dangers.
So um, we'll be delving into some of the issues highlighted um, in that reel, as well as be discussing how we can harness AI for creativity later. But let's bring the panel in and let me introduce you to them. Wonderful. So we have uh, Liam Budd, who works at Equity, the Performing Arts and Entertainment Trade Union. Liam specialises in generative AI. We have Nicola Solomon, chair of the Creators' Rights Alliance, whose aim is to promote, protect creators through policy, advocacy and campaigning work. She's also chief executive of the Society of Authors. We have Gianluca Sergi, Professor of Film Industries at the University of Nottingham. His latest book, The Endless End of Cinema, is co-authored with the seven-time Oscar winner Gary Rydstrom, and it traces the history of cinema through its major crises. And finally, we have Isabel Doran, CEO of the Association of Photographers, who defend, educate, and lobby for the interests and rights of photographers. Both Nicola and Isabel are board directors of the British Copyright Council. So um, the impact on the creative industries by the releasing of generative AI models such as ChatGPT, DALI 3, Stable Diffusion, and so on, are, are vast. Um, and we know what the two biggest headlines of the year have been, um, really around the ethics of using text and images to train these generative models which haven't had the creator's consent and don't compensate them. The second, of course, the writer's strike, where writers voice their concerns about potential job losses and actors their concerns around cloning and losing control of their likeness. But really, this just scratches the surface in terms of the complexity of concerns that AI brings to the creative industries. And we won't be able to cover absolutely everything, but we are going to dive into some of the broad themes that do exist across these industries. Um, but Gianluca, let's start with you. Can you set the scene for us a little bit? You talk about this as a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. What are the creative industries facing at the moment? That's a good question. I wish I had the answer to that question. Okay, so my work uh, focuses on innovation and, and crisis. And crisis is, in this particular case, AI is a very much a global crisis in that it touches every aspect of any sector in the creative industries. And it is global. Um, so when a crisis like this comes, usually there's a moment of great fear, confusion. Some people think it's going to solve all problems. Other people think it's going to end us quite literally sometimes. Um, so it's very important that we, we try to find a way to even approach the problem, to even ask the question. And right now, we are at the very beginning of this crisis. Nobody's really found the, the, the light. Uh, to shine a path uh, along which we can do this. It touches virtually every aspect of my sector is film and screen industries. Um, and the other people here on the panel can talk about other, other sectors as well. Right now, the conversation is uh, virtually touching every possible aspect you can imagine, from uh, tools to make things. Uh, in, in film and television, you, you look at every area. By the way, AI has been used for quite a while. It's not a new thing from visual effects to script writing to script breakdowns. If you're a producer, you can use it for a lot of different things, budgeting and everything else and so on. There are issues, however, for studios as well. There's an assumption, for instance, that studios want to use AI to cut costs and everything else, but that's not as simple as it sounds. In other words, uh, I always use Einstein's quote that complex problems, to solve complex problems, we, we cannot use the same level of thinking that created them in the first place. So we need to raise the game. We need to find a different way to think about it. And the two questions which are really good to ask it here is always, what else is there that I'm not, se I'm not seeing? In other words, can you project this a couple of steps further down the line and realize what are the real problems that are hiding behind these fears and hopes and concerns? And the other one is, what else could be true? Because there could be other things <laughs> that we're not even considering. So I I'm not approaching it from a good, bad, binary, uh, zero sum games uh, uh, approach, and I'm trying to inform policy making and work with, with studios and other companies in, in the States in particular. Mm -hmm. Thank you for mm. that. 
Um, I thought we would start by talking a little bit about consent generally across the industries. Um, and I mentioned this a little bit around the consent of, of training these models, um, such as the large language models, such as the image-based models. Um, Nicola, wh why, is, why is consent important? What should we be thinking about? So I think it's really interesting what, Jennifer, you, you had to say. And I think it's important to start by saying that creators are in a very good position because the whole point about creators is that they think creatively and therefore really able to add to solutions in these areas. But what is not happening at the moment is consultation or a level playing field or consent. And to take one example from my own area, from, from writing area, we recently found that 183,000 books have been, were used to train some of these large language models. Now, the authors and the publishers weren't asked if those books could be fed in. They haven't been paid anything. Um, and yet their works are being used to train these models and to create the new and exciting work that comes out of them. And we know that millions and millions and billions of works of visual artists, of, uh, of performers, of musicians, of other creators have been used to create these models, um, which then have the possibility, in fact probability, that they will compete with their own work where they won't get payment, they won't get credit, and they won't have the possibility of just saying, no, I don't want you to do it, and this isn't how copyright law should work. Mm -hmm. and, and Liam, you've been thinking about this in terms of the performers and what kind of contracts and, and um, frameworks need to be put into place to be thinking about consent. Mm. So our members are actors, singers, dancers, comedians, drag queens, there's a lot really. Um, and for them, consent is paramount. It's how they make their livelihoods. Um, they're engaged on a work to hire basis for different projects throughout the year. And they're engaged by studios, production companies. And they're now being engaged by these companies which are specializing in synthetic media, which is a really fascinating and growing area. Um, and the traditional model for our members would be that they would sign a contract and they'd either license or assign their rights for that company to use their performance. I mean, this is all built on permission, which is how the industry works. But as Nicola's talked about, this sort of mass infringement that's taken place and where our members' work has essentially been stolen, has sort of broken that model. Um, and going forward as well, so our members are often just um, engaged on a, a one-off fee sometimes. They're just an upfront fee. Hopefully that's not always the case, but in some areas of work that is the case. Mm -hmm. But if our members are signing contracts where they're paid for once, uh, for them to have their likeness cloned, for a digital double to be then used forever in perpetuity on an infinite amount of projects that almost makes their work potentially redundant going forward and limits their ability to make a living. So we're trying to establish ethical contracts for our members to take forward so that they can engage in this area of work in an ethical way and feel informed and empowered to negotiate. Mm -hmm. But it's a really difficult landscape and we're at the start of this journey, but we're trying to empower our members to feel like they understand the industry and that they can negotiate fair contracts. And do, do you feel they do understand the industry? Because it's moving so fast and what are the communications and the, the understanding and the implications maybe on, on some of your members? I think we're all on a journey. Um, it's why we, we published our AI toolkit, which has a huge um, array of guidance for our members so they understand a bit more about the industry. They understand their legal rights, which is actually a gray area for performers at the moment. Um, and they understand what ethical contracts look like. But I think we're doing a big program of work to try and um, encourage our members to really get on top of their contracts going forward. Mm. Isabel, um, I'm going to move on to control. There's, there's a, a, I guess, a relationship between consent and control, but, but what limits and controls do we need to be thinking about um, as these tools are, are being developed? And uh, So, I mean, obviously there are um, uh, a number of different sort of elements that you can bring into that. Um, obviously there are, um, I suppose there are both the technical type of controls, there's contracts, obviously, we've, we've mentioned very briefly, there's licensing. Um, from the technical side, I don't think we've yet arrived at a complete solution uh, with regards to being able to protect the work that's being scraped because it's being scraped on such a massive scale. Um, what you mentioned, um, obviously, Dali um, and Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. Midjourney and Stable Diffusion use the Layon 5B um, data set. Now that data set is 5 billion images. That is pretty much the entire internet. 
But in that time, um, in, you know, since they were launched a year ago, um, there's 15 billion synthetic images that have been created already. And that's about the same sum as a human creator from the visual side has been able to create throughout history to this point. And so therefore, there, there is a, a particular challenge with trying to control that work, their works in that regard. So the approach that they can take is look for you know, technical measures that can help. But um, as we've, we've heard already, um, uh, in, in other conversations that have happened in different, you know, d different spheres, um, a lot of the, uh, I suppose, the technical scraping is done using sort of robot.txt, which is quite a simple, broad spectrum. So even if um, even a, a, a creator who's got all of their works uh, publicly facing on a website because they're selling their wares, they're letting everybody know, I want to be commissioned, I want to, to get some work. If that work has been extracted, but in their terms on their website it says, do not use these images for scraping, it's particularly then difficult to be able to enforce it if you don't know if your work's been scraped, where it's ended up. So the data sets that exist, there's an entire ecosystem of data sets. Um, and then, of course, trying to then identify where the images or you know, text or sound has ended up can be particularly challenging. And, of course, a lot of debate happens on the output in terms of, well, how do you identify that your work has been part of that? Mm -hmm. Um, and just to, just to sort of add to that very briefly, is that if we're talking about the works that have been ingested into something, it doesn't necessarily mean that an entire work can't be copied and outputted, which is what we've seen with some of the cases that have been brought in various different jurisdictions. So the Getty Images case, it was, you know, the work was substantially those works with the logo across it. So it's not to say that it's unique and genuine, there are different permeations, but because it's so vast, how do we enforce it? So we can look at contracts, we can look at the technical measures, and we can look at um, uh, licensing. And licensing certainly is, is one potential solution um, that we should be looking at to start with when those works are ingested. It's quite hard to be talking about control when some of these large models are already created and how do you undo that? Mm -hmm. I mean, the cat's kind of out of the bag in some ways. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and again, I think I've mentioned to you, so what we're talking about here is, is the opt-out solution that is, is, I suppose, being permeated again um, across uh, two creators by the, the various uh, tech developers. But opt-outs, I think, is... is um, misappropriate use of the word because essentially um, if you're requiring a machine to unlearn what it's already learned so it would be like saying to, to a human being you just forget the alphabet start again um, and of course this is the thing um, to be able to, to sort of you know, forget the letter Z or something be non impossible so the machines as we're seeing these programs they're, they're creating different versions so Dali you know Dali started as that then it's two now we've got three there's obviously going to be four, and so on and so forth. Um, and they're not necessarily starting from scratch, and they're not switching off, taking all of those works out. They're actually <clears throat> just creating new iterations and sweeping up more information. And I guess they, the, the thing about models that have had control and consent is often they'll have much smaller bases of data as well. So we are seeing kind of consensual models being created, but they're competing with these enormous models that have been trained on the whole internet on vast amounts of text and images. And so they're kind of un unfair comparisons often. Except that's not necessarily a bad thing because a lot of what's being copied is itself not trusted or not of good quality. So uh, actually, if you want to cre create a quality program and you obtain licenses from trusted sources, you will have better quality and it will not have the problem that these are having at the moment where they are going into this doom spiral because they copy themselves again and again and again and become less and less original and have billions of synthetic but not necessarily inspiring works that can't do what humans can do, which is share life experience or inspire or create empathy or all the things that we want human creators for. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to suggest that you should get a license for a more limited but more quality 
set, and I won't use the words data set because we are talking about human creative works mm -hmm. here. And, and do you think that's being recognised, the kind of advantages of these more limited sets? Mm -hmm. yeah. And certainly some already exist um, uh, already in, that, in this sphere. So we've got um, the likes of Visual, there's Synthesia that um, works in the, the film sector, mm -hmm. Visual is the image sector, mm -hmm. um, and we know that there are more and more sort of uh, smaller um, based uh, AI developers who are looking for consent they're looking to license, they're, they're trying to do the right and ethical thing in that regard. Where we've got the challenges with the much larger um, tech developers who have, a, I suppose, a, a policy of, of simply doing, you know, uh, doing what they want to advance their technologies without considering the consequences for those that it affects. And of course that's a huge benefit for users because Many, many of my members are concerned to use AI models because they are unwittingly infringing other people's copyright by doing so. So they, they will want to go to trusted and licensed sets, and I would hope that consumers feel the same. And, and do you think both consumers and artists, is there a clarity around which of these tools kind of are okay to use and which aren't, whether it's ethically or in terms of the, the images or text that they're getting out of the end of it? I don't think so, not at this stage, um, because where we're talking about, for example, uh, labelling, we, we, as a group, we've talked about it, um, um, and there are different scenarios for each of the different industries, but I think it's particularly important when we're talking about uh, labelling um, in some ways. There are some very good examples that exist already, so we've got, um, uh, there's the C2PA, IPTC, sorry, lots of acronyms, <laughs> um, and the Content Authenticity Initiative. Um, and these are all trying to, to, I suppose, provide measures, but from a machine-readable perspective. So um, a machine-to-machine -machine can read them, but that doesn't necessarily then um, uh, play out when you're looking at the general public, so the end user, the consumer. How are they going to be able to identify when they just look at an image or read a piece of text or listen to a piece of sound um, or watch a film? Whether that work is completely synthetic. So in your clip, which Nicola and I managed to sneak mm. and look at, mm. we weren't supposed to, but we did, <laughs> um, was, of course, the moon landing and Nixon talking about the moon landing. Now, of course, with the moon landing, that we know what was... Well, we're, hopefully we're all of a generation that remembers um, the clips that we've seen. We may not have been born in, in that year or, or perhaps older, but the point is, is that we know. We've got a new generation coming through who, if you dub over that... It, it has the potential to change history. It has the potential to really impact um, the, the, the social history that we know yeah. of where you know of how we've arrived to where we are, and that's that's particularly concerning. So you do need to, in a way, provide a label that is visible. Um, it doesn't have to be a big, huge label. It just needs to be something discreet. But the public certainly need to know when something is synthetic and something is human authored. Mm -hmm. So I guess here we're talking about some of the kind of provenance tools that are being created where it doesn't necessarily show it, you know, by looking at it with, with the bare eye, but by digging into the metadata, you can see how that content has been created or edited or altered. Um, and so some of these tools um, shows you essentially the history behind them. It, it does, but we would ask for much more than that. We think, um, and we hear this from the tech companies, either that consumers and creators should opt out or that they should search and find out how things have been used. My members and certainly the general public neither have the capacity or the interest to do that, it needs to be very clearly stated if something is synthetic, if it's a deep fake, and also the risks around using it. I think that many people who are trying out, as we all are, chat GPT and saying do something in the style of, have no idea that by doing that they might be creating something that's copyright infringing. They don't think about it. And what then happens if they are creators, as many people are as amateur creators, and I feel we understand that people do these things for pleasure as well, they, if you send it to a publisher, the publisher's going to go, well, this is a copy, I can't publish it. So we need to work out how these tools can be used in a way that, that you can create onward going creative works which themselves have copyright infringement and aren't, aren't infringing copies of something. So that involves visible identifiers, not just identifiers deep in the machine.
I think, so, if, if, I, if I may, yeah. this is an interesting thing. So obviously, film, television, screen industries are slightly different set of issues, because a studio studios will develop their own language learning models because they don't want to be using Chat GPT. Because of course, if you then end up by accident plagiarizing somebody else's work, then you're in trouble. Uh, uh, let's say, for instance, a film comes out and it finds out that something was plagiarized by accident. We use the old-fashioned word plagiarized because we don't have a new word yet to use for this kind of thing. It would be the studio that is liable, not the AI company, which is obviously something that studios will not do. But there is a, this is what I was mentioning before in terms of thinking ahead in policy making. There's a much bigger problem, which is the value of a movie, say. If, if will audiences pay the same amount of money that they're paying for a, a human-generated movie when they know that it, a film was fundamentally created by somebody pressing a few buttons or prompting a few words? We don't have an answer to that question. In fact, if anything, it seems to be that the opposite is true. Taylor Swift's movie sells tickets at a higher price because the value is considered to be particularly unique to that experience. An AI-generated movie may not corral the same, the same value in, amongst audiences. And so it's not as simple as saying, let's make sure that we know that this has not been copyrighted. There are some serious questions that nobody's asked yet because the research has not been done yet. How would audiences respond? To something like that. So there's, there's, this is why policy making is going to be essential and governance is going to be essential. I think it also shows how unprecedented this technology is. Mm. So in the past we've had technology that can potentially take away an instrument uh, by replacing mm. it. We've had technology which can edit sounds like sampling, but we've never had a technology which can actually imitate the embodiment of a performer or, or, a, or an image. It's quite, um, it's, it's very big, it's very big. Mm. and I think it needs a, a real response to that. Uh, what kind of response? Well, it requires uh, multiple angles. Um, the industry is obviously working very constructively together, but we also need um, an engagement with government, which we are, in terms of the intellectual property office is doing some really great work within its civil servants. But I think for us as equity, we've been campaigning for actual legislation change. Mm -hmm. um, the legal rights around performers is pretty weak. Um, and there are actually no explicit protections around synthetic performances, which gives our members sort of, sort of limited ability to control where their performance is being used in the legal framework. So for us, we've been campaigning for explicit um, performance rights in relation to synthetic media. And we've also been campaigning for image rights. So in certain states in America, for example, New York or California, you have the right over your image, and you, um, whereas we don't have a system here in the UK. I think when we're moving into the world of, of synthetic media where your image or likeness can be used and you have digital doubles, uh, we feel that there should be legal protections around how that's used. And so is this around capturing the, the data that can then create these synthetic models in the future or the way that those, that those models will then be used? Like, can you give me a little bit more detail on, on what, that, what those restrictions or control around that could look like? Sorry, say that again, sorry? So, so if we're talking about synthetic doubles, for instance, mm -hmm. what, what would you like the protections to be put in place for those performers? So we would like there to be explicit protections so that they consent to their performance being used in that way. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, there isn't um, in the legislation. Um, so we would like that additional protection so our members can actually say, if you're doing a digital double, you have to get consent from the performer. So at the moment, if a performer was to be filmed and then, they, then there's nothing to protect them at the moment from taking that material and creating synthetic doubles and using them. It's a big grey area, to be honest. Um, so we've had members who have found that their likeness or their image has been cloned without their consent and they found it around the world being used. Um, and the copyright framework right now doesn't give the protections our members need particularly in relation to synthetic performances. We were also talking earlier on about also the kind of pressure of those performers when they might be asked to sign something on the spot, they might not even really understand what the implications are. Yeah, so there is, on an individual basis for a performer, there is little bargaining power often to negotiate your own terms. This is why trade unions are so important, because uh, we nego negotiate collectively on behalf of our members. But if you're being asked, um, often if you're being asked um, to engage in this kind of work, it's on a take it or leave it basis. Mm -hmm. This is your contract. You either do it or you don't. Um, and so many of our members feel they just have to sign these contracts to get work. Mm -hmm. 
But when we've got a contractual terms saying you're signing away your likeness in perpetuity, uh, take it or leave it, some of our members are just are signing those contracts to get work because they want to earn a living, but that then leads to problems later down the line. So as a, as a trade union, we're trying to change the industry and establish more ethical terms for engaging performers. Mm -hmm. And in the image industry, I mean, it's, um, it, we were talking about uh, this yesterday, so if, it's a slight nuance, a slight difference in that respect where um, uh, because they're not, for example, you may have performers all working for um, a broadcaster. For us, our members are working on an individual basis. So there, there are many sort of commissioners, many sorts of brands. And so uh, in that respect, uh, where a contract is, is agreed, um, they don't necessarily have the, the, the same, um, I suppose, uh, pressure from a, a trade association or trade union. Um, whilst they'll still come to us about a contract, um, it's still particularly challenging in the respect that um, the bargaining position is, is much weaker from, from their perspective as individuals. Um, and again, it, the same problem, though, in terms of they're in a position of, of um, not having the ability to say, no, I don't want this in a contract necessarily. Although what we are seeing um, is, I suppose, two sides at this particular point in time, where we've got some, uh, for example, brands and commissioners who are doing the right thing and being ethical and being upfront to say, um, we've put in an AI clause, but this is what we're saying here is we won't use your materials for AI. Mm -hmm. However, we're also now seeing examples where some are putting into contracts um, that uh, that they will be, you know, um, so for example, a, a product shot, etc. They're, they're pushing the boundaries by saying, we don't just want you to take this one single product shot. We want your entire studio captured. Um, so that you provide us with the dimensions, we'll then use both your studio and the product setting and just swap out the products. So then suddenly, where that person may have been hired for, for you know, 10 product shots, it's just the one plus their studio, um, which you could argue is, is sort of pushing the boundaries of intellectual property. But again, it's that position in which do they say no um, and potentially lose that, that job? or do they accept? Mm. And it's across the board, isn't it? No. It is. I mean, for all creators, there are similar questions. And what we really need to be looking at is if we value creativity, we have to create conditions in which not only big brands can be rewarded, but the small people can continue, that we can have diverse industries so that people have entrance routes into those industries, whether they're funded publicly or privately, where they can continue to work whether a fair tax and benefits. Because at the moment, one of the other things that's problematic is it is cheaper to buy and use a machine for which you will get capital allowances than to take on a person for which you will have to pay national insurance and tax. So we don't even have a level playing field even if you treat both a creator and a machine as a commodity that you can use. And that's really problematic. So I think it, this is about equity and it's also about us all thinking and, and having open discussions about what these tools mean for us, how we want to use them. And I think consumers need to be included in this as well. And how we can protect and ensure that we continue with creativity because KPMG has, has suggested that 43% of writing jobs will go, 43%. That is enormous and existential for our members. So we need to think about what we want to do to make sure we protect the things that inspire us, that give us huge enjoyment and that help us make sense of the world. And I think that it's important that consumers understand this, that they can be involved in these in these conversations. But they can't do that without knowing how the stuff is being used in the first place and without ensuring that there's payment for it. So I was going to move on to compensation and the kind of finances around this, which is hugely complicated, um, as all of these issues are and, and entangled. What... I mean, what recommendations do you have in terms of understanding how you compensate around AI? Mm. Well, as Jean-Luc says, there's not one answer to any of this, but we do actually in this country have really good licensing solutions that have always been used for big problems. You know, photocopying is itself a big problem that we manage perfectly well through licensing solutions. There's 
um, streaming, although we are uncomfortable with some of the models and the way it's divided between the industries, does allow micro payments to be made to large numbers of creators. So we have all of this set up with very good collecting agencies, and this is about tech companies engaging. But when you put a value on something, the value can't just be the value of what is outputted. We have to look at the value that this is our creations have added to these companies. And that is huge. So if they're getting huge amounts of advertising revenue from it, we need to ensure that creators share in that because they have provided the basis for the value of such companies. And we need to look at that. But, but negotiation for what is wanted and needed is something that collecting societies do on a mass basis every single day. And it is not impossible in, in any means. Mm -hmm. Liam, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think just from an equity perspective, we're having this conversation right now. Um, so we negotiate collectively with um, all the producers, with the streaming platforms, with the BBC, ITV. We actually have a really strong industrial framework for negotiating. And so we'll be having these conversations around AI with all, with all of our industry partners. Mm -hmm. And one of the big conversations will be, what is fair payment for uh, creators when we have generative AI being used? Mm -hmm. Are the creative industries coming together to have these discussions around things like compensation? So what's incredible for me, and uh, the Creative Rights Alliance, but I think is fair for all of us, is I've never seen the creative industries so aligned on anything. And when I say the creative industries here, which is a word that I don't usually use because we normally talk about creators, I'm talking about the publishers, the producers, and everybody. We are all up in arms that our work has been stolen, and we all think that it's not viable. And we have to remember that the creative industries jointly generate £113 billion for this country. We are a net exporter of creators. We are world-beating. We have to support these industries. It's in everyone's interests that we do so. So, yes, I've seen everyone coming together. But I've also seen huge will to think about the ethics in a way that publishers and others, not words that they generally use, about how we should be using this, how we should, how we should be labelling, whether we should be using tools for editing, whether we should be using them for translation, what is really a creative work, what is not a creative work, how will copyright be assigned? These are big questions that I have seen a real will to talk about as an industry. And actually, that's really refreshing. I think it's important that the public is brought in. And I think it's important, and what's good about a conference like this, is these are being replicated across all industries in all different ways with AI. And we've all got insights that we can feed in and solutions that, that should not be beyond us. Mm -hmm. but it has to start with transparency from some of these companies about what they're doing and, and a, an acceptance that some of it is dangerous and unfair and that we need to be using AI ethically. I think you'll see that, the, again, sorry, it's kind of odd one out a little bit, because film and the screen is a little different in the sense that you have so many different people working on something. You will see writers and actors, you all know because of the strikes, being very much focused on this issue of compensation contractually. And the contract that the WGA, just uh, the Writers Guild of America, the Union for Writers, has just uh, agreed on, will provide a template probably that to use in other categories. But then you look at the directors and producers, they have a very different approach to this. They have far less concern because, the co because their work is impacted differently by AI. Then you look at everybody, the so-called below the line crafts, uh, cinematography, editing, sound, costume design, art director, they are going to discuss this in the next year because they have their contract negotiations coming up. So there are, there are different, and studios themselves, they're, they're all different, they don't know yet. Again, it's like tentatively moving in the dark and bumping into chairs and tables, not knowing exactly how to play this. Uh, one uh, one un unintended consequence, for instance, is now contracts are gonna be far shorter than they used to be. Mm. So sometimes it'd be like five years contract, 10 years contract, so you know what's gonna happen in the next, you, you have a basis for, Planning, for instance, um, but now the WGA. See, I don't like think that will happen, but I don't think that will happen. One of the things that we are very concerned about as creators is rights grabs, mm -hmm. and rights grabs by producers and others saying, "Well, I don't know what the uses will be, so I'll take all the rights, so I can use them." Mm -hmm. But also, I think we need to start be looking out for where we tick those bits going, I accept all cookies, are we also accepting that our work will be replicated, will be used, ingested for training purposes, will be used in different ways? 
I think a lot of us very carelessly sign away rights uh, every single day without thinking about it. And I imagine that to begin with, before they get shorter, there's going to be a bit of a rights grab that people need to be very careful about. Sure, so and and I was going to say this relates very importantly to um, the emerging talent. So the, the mm. younger generation that are in universities at the moment who are, who are studying with the hope of um, you know, uh, uh, carrying through their creative career into a profession. I mean, we're, we're obviously from the professional side, um, we, we, we work with professionals all the time. Um, I mean, for example, in the, uh, in the UK, we're estimating about 30,000 professional photographers. We've got all the emerging talent um, leaving university, graduating, and the, the concern about how we, A, encourage them to learn and understand about contracts, about copyright, about the framework that they're coming into as an industry, but also new competition, which is, of course, this generative AI side of things, um, really is quite a challenge. Are they going to be competing with the generative AI? Are they going to, um, when they're, I suppose, hopefully, you know, brought in by a commissioner, will, um, uh, will part of that um, commissioning process be, well, here's an AI um, program that's really simple and easy that we can use, or you know, we uh, you know, challenge the emerging talent with saying, well, we can only afford to pay £100 a day, mm -hmm. as opposed to what the rate would be now, which would be 7, 000, you know, 700 to thousands all the way up. Um, and this is part of the challenge in that respect, is the hollowing out of our creative industry so that you become, we end up with uh, going back to, returning to an elitist approach where effectively you've just got those who can afford to do it because they don't have to worry about generating income and interestingly enough it had it has kind of happened with documentary photography we used to have a lot of um, editorial um, uh, publications where you would feature photographers and other you know storytellers going around the world you know telling everybody about it um, and of course that that market has fallen away and effectively hollowed out so uh, a lot of documentary photographers who want to tell the world about what's going on have very little opportunity to be able to share that. And so it's you know, trying to encourage them to think about different pathways. But importantly, the creative industries, the, the reason it works is because we've got fantastic creators who are very talented at what they do. That's why they do it, is because they, they're, they're, they're skilled and talented at it. And to have an unlevel playing field, which is what Nicola was mentioning earlier, where we just have um, a, a, dis, you know, a sort of lack of consideration for this talent means that we're depriving you know, the UK effectively um, and other industries across the world of that creative talent and what it brings. It's not just one isolation, it's across the board we need to you know, support the next generation coming through. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask where we're seeing AI being used in the different sectors in a really useful and positive way. So I guess there are both the tools that we're really familiar with, like ChatGPT and Dali and Midjourney, but also really specific tools that actually have been created for years and years for whether it's film industry, whether it's whether it's in audio, um, that are actually really really helping to either drive creativity further or are being used to do some of the process parts of production. I mean, uh, although it's not my area, I know there's lots of tools in music, for example, mm -hmm. which can allow you, I mean, we've used synthesizers for the years and this is a move on from that. Um, but the tools that can do the bits which are not essentially creative are amazing. They can put the metadata on it, do labeling, do proofreading. I mean, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't really use anything without spell check these days. These are all things that can help in one's work. And then there are plenty of tools being developed that can help you with plot line or, or storyline or can check your work. Um, but it's really important to make sure that those are being used ethically. And whereas I might have been excited about them if they'd been trained on copyright work and properly licensed, there is the massive concern that by doing them you are unwittingly infringing other people's work or indeed are feeding your own work in and unwittingly feeding a machine and making it better. And certainly I've seen translators say to me, I used a translation tool and three books in, my own words were coming back at me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Liam, there are some, some interesting tools around dubbing as well, aren't there? Yeah, there are. 
Um, there's an interesting um, company called Flawless AI, which is using um, AI to sort of make the dubbing process look really smooth and mm -hmm. pretty amazing, actually. Um, but they're looking at how they can do that in an ethical way. They're not, they're using it to support and they're not uh, replacing actors in the process. Mm -hmm. So they're still hiring actors to do the voice work, but they're using AI to streamline the process of how it looks on the screen. And that's a really interesting model. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, we really, we're not anti-AI. We support innovation if it's used in an ethical way. Mm -hmm. And for us, we want to just make sure that we're not completely replacing the industry with this kind of technology. Finally, I just wanted to ask each of you if you had a kind of message for Bletchley Park, one thing that they should be listening to at the moment, uh, what, what would that message be? Um, Liam, maybe we can start with you. I think for us, um, it would be have a conversation with the trade unions and with equity about um, strengthening the legal framework for performers' rights, something that we're really campaigning for and would love to move the government forward on that point. Great. Nicola? Yes, I would also say bring creators into the conversation, be aware of the uses that are being made of, uh, of creative works, and remember that human creativity is essential in our lives, and therefore it's really important to talk to creators and others with the tech companies to find out how these tools can be used to support, this technology can be used to support what we do and to create a level playing field. And that involves wider thinking across other areas such as taxation and benefits and competition as well as just copyright and those areas but certainly bring us in and bring the public into the conversations and be transparent. Gianluca. Be careful what kind of narrative you decide to tell about AI. Uh, the, the, the story, the, the crisis, for when an earthquake strikes it may kill people, destroy buildings but what happens, but the story that is told then about what's happening, what kind of a crisis it is, then determines the responses that we give to it. So right now we know what the crisis, the original point of crisis is, AI, apart from the fact that we can't even agree on what AI actually is. But I'm assuming for a moment that we can agree on that. Okay, so fine, so we know what's happened. The earthquake is AI. So what kind of story are we, going to, are we going to tell? Are we going to say the world is ending and some people are saying that and forget about everything else because it doesn't matter, we throw your hands up? Or are we going to tell a story of resilience and adaptability, <laughs> innovation, in which case that will determine the responses that we all give. So I would say be careful the story, the narrative you spin. Mm -hmm. mm. um, and to, to a certain extent, because we, we started this journey uh, a year ago already, it does feel as if the creative industries are the, sort of the canary in the coal mine. We always seem to be the ones thrown under the bus mm -hmm. first, shall we say. Um, and so I think it's really important that um, the government acknowledges and recognises that the creative industries, you know, um, especially the UK creative industries, are um, recognised globally for the, the, for the, um, the human author content that we produce. I mean, it's incredible, the array of, of works that we produce. Um, and so, therefore, we really need to tackle um, how, uh, you know, how we deal with the, the, uh, the large, giant tech uh, companies. They need to, there needs to be, uh, we need to be fostering more transparency and more accountability because in a way they're really not, um, I suppose, there's too much dismissiveness, if you see what I mean. It's, it's kind of, well, let's worry about the, the more threatening things. But if you don't have a creative industry that, that um, works alongside uh, other sectors, other industries, will be much poorer for it. Um, I mean, even if you look at the graphic designs of, of, of um, AI Fringe, there's a human, uh, you know, uh, creative designer behind that or design team behind it who've, who've created these, these beautiful uh, graphics. Um, and this is why it's really important to support um, and to consider uh, the, the creative industries in that respect. But we need to start with the accountability and the transparency over what goes into those massive data sets. Because if we have no eye on, you know, no idea of what goes into there, how can we have any control and the conversation that we've been having this, uh, this morning? Great. I wanted to turn over to the audience to see if there were, there were questions for the panellists. Uh, is it possible to turn the lights up a little bit? So <laughs> There's someone there. Someone in the middle. Okay. Um, 
so two things. Okay, I come from a position of a techno optimist, so I'll, I'll lay my stall out and uh, and then I'll go from there. So um, the two things that are going to be affected are uh, cognition and creativity. Now, in this, coming to the creativity side, one of the challenges that I had talking to somebody who did work for me is that if what took took him two weeks to build a mood board, now he was able to do in say a day or two. So his basis for charging me, which was the time he spent, is now completely broken. So is that an effect? Is that, is that a worry that we are moving to a new paradigm? That's the first part. And the second part is, should we look at whether Steven Spielberg is being going to be replaced, or what Steven Spielberg with AI is going to be able to produce? Uh, I, yeah, I, I can try to answer that. <laughs> Um, okay, so there is an issue, the, oh, there are at least three different ways to answer that question. W one is ethical. Uh, a lot of people talk about AI in terms of optimization uh, and, and um, you know, productivity. Uh, but there is another way, if you want to approach it, which is ethical. So what's the good of the world and what can I do to help the world be a better place? Not everybody will respond to that, obviously. There will be business... Uh, imperatives. So how about this one? We don't remember what I was telling you, I think a couple of steps down the line. You're talking about a, a very specific example. Let me give you a slightly bigger example. Let's imagine that a studio does decide, develop a perfectly good uh, AI system, which uh, enables it to use 10 extras rather than 100, two editors rather than five, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, do things faster, 50 days instead of 100, fine. Then they come to the UK to film. And most of the US studios now film in Pinewood Studios or Livesden Studios and so on. And they come here because of the uh, tax incentives that the UK government gives them. And that goes up to 39%, 40% of the overall cost. Right. So follow me for a moment. What happens if the UK government changes policy, and this is why policy making is so important, and says, well, if you're a Disney, I'm, I'm picking on Disney. I could pick anyone. Please, don't, Disney, don't sue me. Uh, <laughs> If Disney or Warner Brothers or Paramount or Universal come and say, we're making this movie, uh, we would like the 40% rebate, please. If the UK government says, hold on a minute, are you using AI? Question number one, yes. How are you using it? Question number two. How many people are, are actually working on this movie? Because this, if it is a lot less, there is less money coming into the economy here. There's less job creation. And so we're not going to give you 39%. We're going to give you less. So as you can see, there are immediate concerns on the individual, and I agree entirely, but there are also much bigger conversations around policy making that unless people begin to think about it now, we may end up getting locked. This is why it's important to, think, to look at it as a crisis much more widely. It's not just the one person, it's everybody, everybody gets caught up in this kind of vicious circle, where then it's almost like a deflationary, <laughs> where everything is valued less. Our audiences are not prepared, going to prepare to pay as much, and their governments are not going to prepare to give those uh, those um, tax incentives, and people are going to get paid. Less. So you see, you see what I mean. And, and it's certainly something that's not going to happen immediately. Um, so you're not going to see an immediate sort of crisis mm -hmm. where suddenly everybody loses their their job. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen over a period of time. So if you estimate about five years, if we have this conversation in five years' time, what's that conversation going to look like? Are we talking about a diminished creative uh, industry where you can't resource, where uh, you can't find those people who have those skills, but perhaps you decide you do need after all because maybe the tech isn't quite what you were imagining or you want to return to a more traditional approach. So, um, the, you know, the hollowing out, which I mentioned earlier, is something that you do need to consider more broadly rather than... Yeah. And, and I completely agree with you that the relationship between ethics and economics is key here. We're not talking about... You know, creators aren't the ministry of fun. We're professionals who make a living. And ethics isn't there. It has its own value, but it also has a value because we, as an economy, need money to be in the hands of individuals who spend it and not in the hands of tech companies who save it or who don't pay their tax in this country or who spend it elsewhere. That doesn't do anybody any good from an economic point of view. So it makes perfect sense to incentivize, to ensure that individuals are paid. And I would also say on the using of tools, it was also quicker once, you know, a typewriter was invented to start typing things more quickly. 
and perhaps I should use an example, when I was a solicitor in private practice, obviously partners charged more than trainees, but we worked on the basis that actually whoever did the job, it should come out at the same price because you charged a higher hourly rate if you were better and more expert at using the tools. So maybe if you can just create something as good, we shouldn't be asking you how many hours you took to do it. That may be just irrelevant. It's the value, as a, to, the, it's yeah. the value to you of what I'm providing. It's a question. Right at the back there. Hi there. I'm one of the uh, humans who created the designs for the A French. Thank you for your kind words. <laughs> really good. Um, <laughs> assuming we get through this turbulence and uh, a few years down the line, we've got legislation in place and protections that satisfy us to some degree. I wonder if the panel could speak to the exciting possibilities of some of these AI tools, including, could for example, yeah. I, I wonder if th you could speak to the exciting possibilities of these AI tools, including perhaps uh, style transfer. What could we do with this? Is the re reinterpretation of works exciting? Is it about lowering barriers for younger creators? Yeah. Um. There are some really exciting things out there. So if you're an actor and you get your likeness cloned, you could be paid for doing jobs around the world that you're not actually doing in person. Um, so you could actually increase your income um, whilst doing very little. Um, so if you have that in, uh, established in a very ethical way, that could be really exciting and um, boost your income on an individual level. Uh, from an equalities angle, it could uh, increase access into the labor market for our disabled members. There's lots of opportunities there in terms of access. Um, it could increase the safety around stunt work. There's lots of things there that could be positive. It's just how it's implemented in an ethical way in, in conversations with trade unions as well. And I would always say creators are creative. So actually, we should be putting that question back to you. Uh, you know, I'm not, uh, 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 my job is to make to assist creators, but my members are massively playing with all this technology and come up every single day with innovative ways to use it and ways certainly the people who designed it did not expect it to be used. That's what creators do. And if, if you look at the history of all these key moments of crisis around the major technology, there are some unlikely friendships and partnerships that emerge because people, people can't imagine what the, what the future holds. And so people who are now not working with each other may end up working, collaborating much more closely. So you can imagine different workflows that lead to different kinds of creativity. In, in film, workflows stayed the same for a very long time, and then you know, virtual production came in and changed the way in which things were done. And this one could do the same. And yes, they're gonna be, there's always a price to pay, but if the value for what you pay is fair and uh, equitable, then why not? Yeah, so that's that's yeah. And that goes um, so. Of course, with the the, the, the visual side of things, um, there are a number of tools, and of course, um, the uh, you know, photographers have been using tools, AI tools, for at least a decade already. And of course, you know, with, when we're talking about Mid Journey, um, you know, Dali, and um, Stable Diffusion, of course, it's it's like a you know kid in a sweet shop. It's kind of wow, okay, I've got so many different possibilities here. But I think what's missing is the messaging behind it is, well, what, what are you doing by doing this? And, and this is, I suppose, the, the message that I would want to convey is, whose job are we replacing? Who, who would we have ordinarily gone to? You know, um, and this is, this is, I think, the key point it, where ethics comes back into it is, these are, are you know, exciting tools and you know, sweets in a sweet shop are, are tasty, they're fantastic, but they're not always good for your teeth. And it's the same sort of principle behind um, the fact that um, what are we, re who are we, the, um, who are we replacing by adopting these tools, um, and just that consideration of okay, well, you know, is there a way that I can use these tools and uh, still at the same time work with other people to so using it as an assisting tool rather than a replacement. Okay, I think we're going to have to bring things to a close. We are out of time. Thank you, uh, audience, for your questions. Thank you, panel, so much for a really interesting discussion. Um, we are actually hosting um, a AI and storytelling event at the University of Arts London tomorrow evening. So if you are interested to continue this discussion 
around the ethics of AI and creativity. We'll be holding a fishbowl discussion, which is in, in, allows the audience in to be part of thinking about what kind of policy needs to be uh, be, be thought about at the moment, um, as well as kind of the creative potential. So I, I invite you to come and continue this discussion tomorrow evening. But in the meantime, thank you very much uh, for being here today and to the AI Fringe for hosting us. Thank you.